The trouble is not in dying for a friend, but in finding a friend worth dying for. Mark Twain The statement probes the depth of human relationships, contrasting the ultimate sacrifice with the challenge of discerning true, deep friendship. It suggests that loyalty and bravery are perhaps more common than the existence of friendships that justify such extreme devotion. The rarity and value of such bonds are highlighted, implying that while many may be willing to lay down their lives for a friend, the real struggle lies in cultivating relationships of such caliber and trust that they warrant such sacrifice. This reflection prompts us to consider the qualities we value in friendships and to assess whether our relationships are built on convenience or profound connection. It also touches on the theme of discernment in our social bonds, urging a quality over quantity approach. The underlying lesson is a call to foster meaningful connections that are robust and worthy. It's a reminder to invest emotionally in those who reciprocate with equal measure, and in doing so, create a circle of friends with whom the exchange of the highest acts of loyalty is not only possible but justifiable. Let us live so that when we come to die, even the undertaker will be sorry. This poignant remark attributed to Mark Twain serves as a compelling directive to live a life of substance and positive impact. The statement suggests that the measure of our lives lies in the impression we leave on others, including those accustomed to death. Twain is urging us to live in such a way that our actions and character instill a sense of loss even in those who deal with death as a profession, indicating a life marked by kindness, significance, and perhaps, joy brought to others. The Undertaker's sorrow becomes a metaphor for the universal impact of a well-lived life. It's an encouragement to cultivate relationships, contribute to our communities, and pursue passions with the kind of vigor that leaves an indelible mark. The lesson here is to live deliberately, with intention and warmth, so that our legacy is felt widely and deeply. Twain challenges us to consider the breadth of our influence and the depth of our connections, inspiring a life of genuine richness that is felt even in our absence. Do the right thing. It will gratify some people and astonish the rest. Mark Twain This aphorism, often attributed to Mark Twain, encapsulates his witty and observant perspective on human nature and morality. The phrase, do the right thing, is a timeless call to ethical action, urging individuals to make choices based on principles and integrity rather than convenience or self-interest. Twain's quip also reflects a keen understanding of societal reactions to virtue. He acknowledges that while acting with integrity will please those who value righteousness, it will also surprise those who have become cynical or who expect self-serving behavior as the norm. The duality of the response, gratification and astonishment, suggests that moral actions can serve both as a reassurance of good in the world and as a challenge to the prevailing expectations of society. The underlying insight is a commentary on the rareness of moral courage and the power of ethical conduct to influence others. It implies that by choosing to do what is right, we not only affirm our own character, but also have the potential to inspire and shape the social conscience. The lesson is that while doing the right thing may not always be easy or popular, it has the unique capacity to resonate with and impact others in profound ways. Honesty is the best policy when there is money in it. Mark Twain This quip by Twain is a satirical take on the adage honesty is the best policy, suggesting that honesty is often contingent upon its profitability. It cynically implies that moral virtues like honesty are not practiced for their own sake, but are instead calculated decisions based on self-interest. Twain's statement invites us to scrutinize the purity of our principles when they intersect with financial gain. The lesson here is a prompt to self-reflect on our motivations for honesty. Is it a core value, or does it waver in the face of monetary incentives? True integrity, 
Twain hints, is honesty maintained regardless of profit. If you pick up a starving dog and make him prosperous, he will not bite you. This is the principal difference between a dog and man. Mark Twain Mark Twain's statement draws a stark contrast between the gratitude and loyalty often exhibited by animals and the more complex and sometimes less noble responses humans may display. By highlighting the dog's loyalty in response to kindness and prosperity, Twain points to a simplicity in animal relationships that is sometimes absent in human interactions, where benevolence is not always reciprocated and where motivations can be multifaceted. The underlying insight is a commentary on human nature and gratitude. Twain suggests that humans, unlike dogs, may forget past kindnesses when they find themselves in improved circumstances. The lesson here is twofold, to appreciate the unassuming loyalty of animals and to reflect on the human capacity for gratitude and the factors that influence our responses to generosity. It's a call to strive for a purity of response to kindness that aligns more closely with the uncomplicated fidelity of the dog in the proverb. If you don't read the newspaper, you are uninformed. If you read the newspaper, you are misinformed, Mark Twain. This statement, attributed to Mark Twain, encapsulates a critical view of the media landscape that remains relevant today. It highlights the dilemma faced by individuals seeking information, the risk of ignorance from avoiding news altogether versus the potential of being misled by inaccuracies or biases present within the news itself. Twain's remark points to the challenges of media literacy and the importance of critical thinking when consuming news. It's a cautionary note about the quality and objectivity of reporting, implying that news sources can sometimes distort reality either through omission, commission, or presentation. The insight here urges us to question the information we receive and to seek a broad range of sources to form a well-rounded view of world events. It's a reminder of the responsibility that comes with staying informed, encouraging skepticism and engagement in a complex media environment. The lesson is not to retreat from being informed, but to be discerning in our consumption of news, recognizing that informed citizenship requires effort beyond just reading the newspaper. Good friends, good books, and a sleepy conscience. This is the ideal life. Mark Twain Mark Twain's portrayal of the ideal life with this quote is a blend of simplicity and depth. He suggests that the essence of a fulfilling existence lies in the joy of companionship, good friends, the enrichment of the mind, good books, and inner peace, a sleepy conscience. Good friends epitomize the social connection and support essential to human happiness. Good books represent the pursuit of knowledge, the pleasure of escapism, and the growth that comes from intellectual engagement. A sleepy conscience, perhaps the most intriguing element, implies a state of being without internal conflict, guilt, or moral unease, suggesting a life lived in such a manner that it permits restful contentment. Twain's vision of an ideal life encourages us to seek balance, nurture relationships, engage with culture and learning, and maintain ethical integrity. While the phrase sleepy conscience could be interpreted as advocating for a lack of moral engagement, it is more likely Twain is advocating for living in a way that leaves us untroubled by our choices, thus allowing our conscience to sleep peacefully. The takeaway is a life of harmony, continuous learning, and moral satisfaction. Age is an issue of mind over matter. If you don't mind, it doesn't matter for Mark Twain. This classic witticism from Mark Twain offers a lighthearted yet insightful take on aging and the power of perspective. Twain suggests that the significance we place on age is largely psychological. Our personal outlook can greatly influence how we experience the process of aging. In essence, Twain is highlighting the subjectivity of age. 
If one maintains a youthful spirit and does not fixate on the number of years lived, then the physical and societal implications typically associated with age can have less impact on one's quality of life. It's an encouragement to focus on mental and emotional vitality rather than succumbing to the limitations often imposed by societal norms surrounding age. The deeper message is that age should not be an insurmountable barrier to ambitions, happiness, or self-perception. The quote is an invitation to embrace a mindset that defies age-related stereotypes and to live in a manner that reflects our inner self, not our chronological age. The lesson is that while we cannot alter the passage of time, we can change our reaction to it, thus controlling its relevance to our lives. Both marriage and death ought to be welcome. The one promises happiness, doubtless the other assures it. Mark Twain Mark Twain's quote humorously contrasts two significant life events, marriage and death, with a satirical edge. On marriage, he implies that it carries the expectation of happiness, a promise that countless people enter into with hope and enthusiasm. However, by adding doubtless, Twain injects a subtle note of skepticism, coyly hinting at the potential disappointments or complexities that married life can entail, despite its joyful commencement. Turning to death, Twain employs macabre humor to assert that death, unlike marriage, offers a guarantee. The assurance he speaks of is not one of joy, but of finality and the cessation of life's trials and tribulations. In this ultimate stillness, there is a darkly comedic suggestion that one finds the certainty that eludes us in the myriad experiences of life, including the institution of marriage. Through this juxtaposition, Twain invites contemplation on the nature of happiness and the human inclination to seek it out, whether through the bonds we form with others or in the solitude of our own mortality. The quote reflects a deeper commentary on the human condition, our perennial search for contentment and the ironic twists that life, and ultimately death, present. It serves as a reminder of the unpredictable journey of life, the aspirations we hold for bliss, and the inevitability that awaits us all, with an encouragement to maintain a sense of humor about the grandeur and the absurdity of our existence. Clothes make the man. Naked people have little or no influence on society, Mark Twain. Mark Twain's famous statement, clothes make the man. Naked people have little or no influence on society is a witty remark that speaks to the social importance of appearance and the role of clothing as a marker of status and propriety. At its surface, the quote humorously notes that clothing is what distinguishes a person's acceptability and capability to participate effectively in social affairs. On a deeper level, Twain is commenting on the superficial aspects of societal judgment and the value placed on external appearances. The adage implies that the clothes one wears can greatly affect how one is perceived and treated by others, often regardless of one's true character or abilities. The statement offers a satirical look at the superficiality with which society often operates, emphasizing the power of attire to confer respectability and influence. Twain's observation encourages us to consider the extent to which outward appearances shape our interactions and opportunities within society, highlighting a preference for form over substance that has long been the subject of social critique. It serves as a reminder to be wary of valuing appearances too highly and to recognize the potential disparity between how a person is seen and who they truly are. It's not the size of the dog in the fight, it's the size of the fight in the dog, Mark Twain. This well-known aphorism, though commonly attributed to Mark Twain, is actually most closely linked to President Dwight D. Eisenhower, and it represents a timeless principle about courage and perseverance. The essence of the saying is that success and tenacity are not determined by one's physical attributes or apparent strength, but rather by the spirit and determination within. 
The size of the dog metaphorically refers to the physical assets or resources one possesses, which can be misleading indicators of the outcome of a confrontation or challenge. Conversely, the size of the fight in the dog suggests that inner qualities such as grit, resolve, and heart are what truly dictate one's ability to overcome obstacles or succeed in competitive situations. The broader lesson is an inspiring one. It encourages the underdog, or those facing adversity, to rely on internal fortitude. It's a reminder that bravery and resilience are often the most decisive factors in any struggle, and that with enough determination, seemingly insurmountable odds can be overcome. It's a call to focus on cultivating inner strength and to not be discouraged by external disadvantages. Martyrdom covers a multitude of sins. Mark Twain Mark Twain's aphorism, Martyrdom Covers a Multitude of Sins, offers a critical reflection on how society views sacrifice and the posthumous glorification of individuals. The phrase suggests that once someone is perceived as a martyr, someone who has suffered greatly or died for a cause, their faults and wrongdoings are often overlooked, forgotten, or forgiven. Twain is highlighting the irony in how the act of martyrdom can elevate a person's status to such an extent that their character flaws or moral transgressions are overshadowed by their ultimate sacrifice. This can lead to a revisionist view of the individual, where their life and actions are idealized. The statement serves as a caution against the romanticization of self-sacrifice and a call to maintain a balanced perspective on individuals' lives and legacies. It prompts a more nuanced understanding of human complexity, reminding us that individuals are a composite of both virtues and vices, and that heroism does not erase humanity. It's a reminder to critically evaluate historical figures and contemporary individuals alike, acknowledging their contributions while also recognizing their imperfections.